All right. Hello and uh, welcome to this current event stream. Um, of course, I get a notification on my phone as soon as I start, but uh, that's fine. Nobody's watching yet and I can edit this out. <laughs> um, okay, so hi and welcome to, uh, I guess, the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, current events stream uh, and news uh where I'm, I kind of go through some of the news items that I've collected over the last two weeks. This is going to be just kind of everything, like a bunch of stuff that came through my feed and just kind of stuff I find important or interesting uh, that, like I say, came through my news feed the last couple weeks. So we're just going to start it off here. Here this screen. All right, so this comes from uh, It's Going Down. Uh, solidarity with this movement to stop cop city and defend Wilani forest um so this there was a statement this came out uh uh this is this has got to be over two weeks ago just after i did my last uh last stream on news which was like i think january 17th so uh we call on the good on all people of good conscience to stand in solidarity with the movement to stop Cop City and defend the Wilani Forest in Atlanta on January 18th in the course of their latest militarized raid on the forest. Police in Atlanta shot and killed a person. This is only the most recent in a series of violent police retaliations against the movement. The official narrative... I'm going to try and pull this up so you can see. This is only the most recent in a series of violent police retaliations against the movement. The official narrative is that Cop City is necessary to make Atlanta safe, but this brutal killing reveals what they mean when they use that word. Forests are the lungs of planet Earth. The destruction of forests affects all of us. So do the gentrification and police violence that the bulldozing of Wilani Forest would facilitate. What is happening in Atlanta is not a local issue. Politicians who support Cop City have attempted to discredit forest defenders as outside agitators. This smear has a disgraceful history in the South, where authorities have used it against abolitionists, labor organizers, and the civil rights movement, among, other, among others. The goal of those who spread this narrative is to discourage solidarity and isolate communities from each other while offering a pretext to bring in state and federal forces who are the actual outside agitators. The consequence of that strategy is on full display on the tragedy of January 18th. Replacing a forest with a police training center will only create a more violently policed society in which taxpayer resources enrich police and weapons companies rather than addressing social needs. Mass incarceration and police militarization have failed to bring down crime or improve conditions for poor and working class communities. In Atlanta and across the U.S., investment in police budgets comes at the expense of access to food, education, child care, and health care, of affordable and stable housing, of parks and public spaces, of transit, and the free movement of people, of economic stability for the many. Concentrating resources in the hands of the police serves to defend the extreme accumulation of wealth and the power by corporations and the very rich. What do cops with their increased budgets and their carte blanche from politicians? Uh, what do cops do with their increased budgets and their carte blanche from politicians? They kill people. Every single day, they incarcerate and traumatize school children, parents, loved ones who are simply struggling to survive. We must not settle for a society organized recklessly upon the values of violence, racism, greed, and careless indifference to life. The struggle that is playing out in Atlanta is a contest for the future. As the catastrophic effects of climate change hammer our communities with hurricanes, heat waves, and, and forest fires, the stakes of this contest are clearer than ever. It will determine whether those who come after us inherit an, an who come after us inherit an inhabitable earth or a police state nightmare. It is up to us to create a peaceful society that does not treat human life as expendable. The forest defenders are trying to create a better world for all of us. We owe it to the people of Atlanta and to the future generations everywhere to support them. So that's the statement, I guess, from uh, the Atlanta forest defenders. Here are some ways to support the defense of forest of the forest in Atlanta. You can donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. This link will be uh, in show notes, I guess. Or maybe, let's put this, I wonder if this will post in. If somebody checks out the, the stream, they can go and there's the first link that we're uh, using. 
Um, so you can call on investors to divest from Cop City, call on builders of the project to drop their contracts, organize political solidarity bail funds, forest defense funds, and forest defense committees, Organize or participate in local solidarity actions. Endorse and circulate this statement of solidarity. Uh, I have not emailed to officially get my name on this list of endorsements, but you can see it's quite a long list of endorsements. And I think like this, uh, I'm, I'll bring up the the defend the Atlanta Forest link, and we'll share this one instead as well or as well. Copy. I'll put this in the put this in the comments on Twitch. So then we've got the first one is that, and the second one is this. Defend the Atlanta org slash solidarity, and it's the same statement, right? And with a, a sign the letter form. So I'm going to just oh I got this. Phew. Okay, Regina, sketchy one. Sign on. All right. Um, so there's a bunch of organizations that have signed on to this. Um, there it looks like like hundreds, thousand. We're looking at like 2,400 people have signed this. So this is, I mean, it's a pretty big deal. Um, the uh, this these uh. The people fighting against Cop City have been there for months. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if everybody has been there the whole time, but like say on January t January 18th, uh, the person uh, known as Tortuguita, I believe, uh, was was killed and uh, by the police. And yeah, so then we've got, uh, this is a, a new thing that just came out yesterday uh, 1300 social justice groups demand Atlanta mayor resign over Tortuguita's death uh, this is from the real news network uh, the story originally appeared in truth out on January 31st 2023 and it is shared here with permission I did not get permission to share this on my stream but I uh, go go to truth out or go to the real news network and uh, you know show show them their your support as well over 1,300 climate, justi climate, justice, and community groups are calling for the Atlanta Mayor Andre, Andre Dickens to resign over the police killing of anti-Cop City activist Manuel Tortuguita Turan uh, on January 18th, issuing a strong rebuke to Dickens for his refusal to even condemn the killing. In their letter, the group said that Dickens has stood firmly on the side of law enforcement as Georgia Republican Governor Brian Kemp has set in the National Guard to crack down on the protests in a continued escalation of the violence and threats of violence against protesters. Mayor Dickens has stood by as police violence and rhetoric towards protesters has steadily ratcheted up, including the use of chemical agents and militarized raids on small groups of protesters engaged in civil disobedience. The letter reads, Less than a month ago, Atlantic City Council members and activists rang the alarm about the dangers of escalated police violence after an aggressive raid on a peaceful protesters on December 13th. Rather than use this as an opportunity to listen or reverse course, Dickens ignored the concerns of council members and his own constituents. Mayor Dickens' lack of intervention in protecting Atlanta prote protesters and residents led directly to the fatal raid. I'm not going to read the entire article, but you get the point. There's a long, uh, a long list of uh, organizations. There's a long list of individuals. There's a lot of people uh, who support the forest defenders and at this point i uh, i find it hard for people in power to uh ignore them to ignore the protesters to ignore the defenders but uh so be it i guess we'll see how it goes um i'm in saskatchewan i'm not going to be there but i uh again i any i will give links in where you can donate because that's that's always helpful if you're not around. You can donate to, yeah, you can donate to the Atlanta the Defend the Forest um, Solidarity Fund. Put that in the, yeah, put that in the chat as well. So then, there's that. So, at atlsolidarity.org is where you go to uh, 
contribute to that. Um, okay, so let's see what else we got. That's kind of the first few stories, or first art, few articles that I was reading this since last time that I uh, I streamed on news and stuff. Got this other one here. Uh, here I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink myself down real small. Close that. This is from OnlySky.media from M. L. Clark. Four recent failures in climate change response. Uh, so welcome to 2023, another year of corporate and political mediocrity when it comes to climate change response. Yeah, no kidding. It's pretty standard issue stuff with, uh, you know, the neoliberal nonsense that we're in right now. We're in the middle of the World Economic Forum annual meeting. I don't know if that's done now, uh, the meeting in Davos, but yeah, two weeks ago, that was what was going on. I think I talked about that in my last news stream. Um, yeah. Uh, so rhetoric and climate change response and related economic pressure points is currently running hot. On Wednesday, an open letter from a group of patriotic millionaires <laughs> called for the members at Davos to commit to meaningful action. <clears throat> yeah. One signatory, Abigail Disney of the Multimedia Empire, told CBNBC that from her experience at that event, Davos was a farce. Until Davos attendees start talking about taxing the rich, the entire gathering will remain a very public example of how out of touch they really are. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not the only ones. Here are four news items from the past two weeks that illustrate how widespread corporate and political resistance to meaningful climate action and economic transformation remains. News peak hits green energy in Ohio. U.S. fighting against, fa fighting against phasing out gas transport. I'll, I'll give you these uh, this article as well. Carbon offsets are mostly useless at best. Yeah, there's uh, that Guardian article. I'll open that as well. That, I've heard lots of people talk about this. Um, I guess I'm happy that's fine. <laughs> 20 firms behind a third of all carbon emission emissions. And, and maybe this isn't the right one. New data shows how fossil fuel companies have driven climate crisis despite industry knowing dangers. Uh, this might not be the one. Uh, I'll switch back. But yeah, uh, there was an article. Yeah, I think it was in The Guardian, though, like about how... Uh, uh, oh, here it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll open this one. The carbon credits are a scam. I mean, in in some way, you know, we all kind of knew it anyway. <laughs> More than 90% of rainforest carbon offsets are the biggest by the biggest certifier are worthless. Yeah, so this is uh, The Guardian again. The forest carbon offsets approved by the world's leading certifier and used by Disney, Shell, Gucci, and other big corporations are largely worthless and make could make global heating worse, according to a new investigation. The research into Vera, the world's leading carbon standard for the rapidly growing 2 billion uh, <laughs> voluntary offsets market, has found that based on their analysis of a significant percentage of the projects, more than 90% of their rainforest offset credits, among the most commonly used by companies, are likely to be phantom credits and do not represent genuine carbon reductions. So that's like, yeah, it's a big scam. It's, I mean, it's like anything in capitalism, right? Like they really just, they will fake anything so that they can, you know, make money and ignore any problems that have to be fixed that might cost them profits. It's just the nature of the whole system. Uh, so then we got plastics fast factories rising on January 18th. Jordan Gas, poor of talking points, explored a critical test case for a years-long initiative on the part of oil and gas companies, which are trying to pivot for an anticipated end of era with respect to fossil fuel products. In Beaver County, Pennsylvania, a new plastics factory aims to turn the ethane from nearby fracking operations into a 1.6 me million metric tons of plastic pellets annually, primarily prim primarily for single-use plastics. Mm -hmm. So that's like your your forks and your bags and your straws and all that stuff. So I, I guess maybe the the Canadian ban on uh, uh, single-use plastics that they're phasing in hasn't had an effect on the market yet, as they say, like, uh, because that's supposed to reduce the demand, right? Which will decrease the production, which will decrease the carbon emissions, right? 
think that's how it's supposed to work, <laughs> but it hasn't done anything. They're, they're, they're still uh, pumping out these single use plastics and uh, plastic pellets, but uh, news of the fossil fuel pivot has been with us for a while. The aim of U.S. based industries is to sustain an export market of plastic feedstocks and polymers, which are currently flooding many less developed nations. The U.S. joins Qatar, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia as leader in this expanding field, even as China and other Asian countries have either outright banned or begun setting hard restrictions on plastics for import. It's, I mean, you got to hand it to China at least. Like, I'm not a I'm not a big China, China stan, but on some level, you got to like be like, yeah, good for you uh, for not importing like these extra plastics, right? Uh, so, the conclusion, uh, at Davos in the past few days, there has been controversy over the chair, Klaus Schwab, who for the last 52 years has helmed the annual event he founded. Uh, I don't know if people, anybody who might watch this, uh, you listen to Alex Jones or shows about Alex Jones. He really likes, he really hates Klaus Schwab. That's one of these uh, big bads from uh, the conspiracy theory, right? But also like, He's a rich dude heading up a neoliberal organization that isn't doing anything to change the world or make it better. Yeah, so concerns about a lack of a secession plan and his inability to effectively represent the needs of the world today have created all kinds of speculation with respect to might who might actually eventually replace him. All right, okay. So that was, I think I kind of only talked about a couple of these, like, uh, even though there was four of them. The U.S. fight against phasing out gas transport. On Friday, January 13th, Wyoming Republican lawmakers introduced a resolution to phase out electrical vehicle sales, phase out electrical vehicle, vehicle sales in, by 2035. Yeah, in a move expressly designed to protect. Oh, God damn it. I keep forgetting to do this. Switch my tab. I got to pay attention to both screens. I'll get this figured out eventually. So on Friday, January 13th, Wyoming Republican lawmakers introduced a resolution to phase out electrical fuel vehicle sales by 2035 in a move expressly designed to protect oil and gas industries. Arguments for the legislation included the current paucity of fueling stations for electrical vehicles and possibility of waste management sites needed to update the processes to address electric vehicular waste. But mostly this bill sponsored by Senators Jim Anderson and Brian Boner argued that the proliferation of electrical vehicles at the expense of gas-powered vehicles will have a deleterious impact on Wyoming's communities and will will be detrimental to Wyoming's economy and the ability for the country to efficiently engage in commerce. It's amazing how they always they always put the importance of the economy ahead of the importance of uh, you know taking care of the planet. They love that shit. Oh, okay. Here's one from the Anarchist Federation. Oh, did I not? Yeah, I was going to share this. Copy. Put that in the chat. I'll put this link in the chat as well. There. Okay. So, cooperation over dependence. Understanding mutual aid. This is from Anarchist Federation. Uh, dot net. Try and blow it up again. Wrong screen. God damn it. All right. So, mutual aid is a philosophy and practice of proving, providing assistance and support to one another, typically within a community or group. It is based on the idea that people are capable of helping each other and that this type of assistance is more effective and efficient than relying on centralized systems of aid, such as governments and welfare programs. In the context of anarchism, mutual aid is seen as a key principle and practice for building a society based on self-governance and self-organization. Anarchists believe that mutual aid is necessary for creating a truly free and equal society where people are able to take control of their own lives and communities. Hmm. Mutual aid can take many forms. Here are a few examples. Community gardens, where individuals come together to grow food collectively, not only providing food for those who participate, but also creating a sense of community and cooperation among members. Another example is the practice of mutual aid networks, which are groups of people who come together to provide support and resources to one another during times of crisis. For example, during a natural disaster, mutual aid network may provide food, shelter, and medical assistance to those in need. Yeah. So this is kind of just going through uh, 
mutual aid, a, kind of a description of mutual aid. This is, I think, this could be helpful for people who don't really get it. It's from a radical, radical guide. So that's really cool. Uh, make, make sure to check that out. The, uh, okay. Eesh. Some of these side headlines are kind of messed up. But anyway. So this is a description of mutual aid uh, uh, talking about how, uh, yeah, we can do various things, come together as a community and support one another and also like do things, survive and, and hopefully thrive without the centralized government. Uh, it's, it's not always like, I guess, it's not always undermining to the system if we are taking care of ourselves, but also... If we're taking care of ourselves, then we aren't relying on the system as much. So it's like, you got to remember not to do like, you're not trying to do charity. You're trying to do mutual aid where your community comes together and takes care of each other. So yeah. Okay. I'm going to, uh, this is interesting. French court orders Uber to pay some 18 million to drivers company to appeal. Of course they will, because they don't want to pay that money to their drivers. All right. In Paris on January 20th, according to Reuters. Uh, Reuters? Reuters. Reuter? I don't know. French court on Friday order, ordered Uber to pay around 17 million euro, or 18.43 million US, I assume, in damages and lost salaries to a group of drivers who argued that they should have been treated like employees rather than self-employed. Both parties told... Uh, both parties of the case told Reuters. This is a huge victory after a long legal battle, which started in 2020, said lawyer Stephanie Tessier. Tessier? I apologize. Who represented the 139 drivers that had brought the case before the Conseil de Prudhomme's labor court in Lyon. Uh, the court decided that work re the work relationship of his clients should have been qualified as employment contracts which means that Uber should have reimbursed them for professional expenses expenses like the purchase of a car, fuel, and overtime. Uber said it would be appealing, adding, We are determined to make progress on the issue of plat uh, platform workers' rights and are convinced that the right way forward is through social dialogue with the driver's representatives. Uh, social dialogue. Well, no, just fucking pay, guys. Like, just pay people properly instead of, like, pulling a fucking con. And I... I I drove Uber for two years off and on. Like I, for six months, it was a major, major part of my income and maybe even longer than that. But it's just like one of these things, like if you actually paid, like you can't, you could make a living doing this if you actually got paid properly, but they're not, they're not going to do that. Right. So the ruling only applies to the past and does not mean the drivers necessarily have employee status going forward. That's interesting that there would be a, uh, a differentiation that you wouldn't say like, okay, because you were employees in the past, you're employees going forward. But then if you're employees, that still like puts you in a precari precarious position because Uber can just decide, well, no, you guys, we're going to lay off. We're going to get rid of you. The issue of how to qualify the legal status of gig economy workers on, on online platforms in sectors like ride hailing or food delivery is being debated, debated in many countries. Platforms argue that workers are independent and can choose how much and when to work, while, while workers and unions often argue that they should be given the same benefits as employees as they depend on the platforms to earn their living. The Uber spokesperson said that it was the company's aim to build a model that preserves the flexibility they want while guaranteeing concrete improvements in their working conditions. In 2020, France's top court right first recognized the right of an Uber driver to be considered an employee a ruling that has affected the U.S. firm's business model, requiring it to pay more taxes and benefits to workers, such as paid holidays. Earlier this month, Uber announced a landmark sector deal with drivers in France, guaranteeing a minimum of $7.65 €7 net, or $8.25 per ride, setting up a precedent after months of bargaining talks. Uh, and then it says $1 equals 92.9223 euros. So not a full year old. So, yeah. I mean, like I say, I drove Uber for two years. It's, uh, I mean, for me, it worked good because I had the time and I was 
doing like for some of it, it was really good. And for some of it was really bad. There was a time like when I could make decent money when we had a very few drivers in the city, but also you kind of had, that meant that if the, the seven or 10 or 20 of us that were on weren't on, then that meant there was people not getting rides. Right. So then you're not fulfilling the, uh, I guess the market, you're not, you're not doing what, uh, you're not really doing the job, I guess, because so they needed more drivers, I guess, is the kind of the point. So they offered some sort of incentive to sign people up. And there was a lot of people who signed up their friends and family. And then there was too many drivers. So then all of a sudden you could go the whole day without getting a single trip. Uh, and yeah, Regina is not a big enough city to have as many drivers as we have. So that's a, that's a problem. All right, so I'm going to uh it's a tough one to talk about, but I feel like it has to be a person like I've got to talk about Tyree Nichols, uh the <clears throat> young man who was killed by the police. Of course the New York Post says racism didn't kill Tyree Nichols. Moronic poorly trained cops did. Except yeah, that's just fucking dumb. Let's start with NBC News, ABC News. Go.com. So we've got Tyree, Ni- Tyree Nichols, a timeline of the investigation into his death. How long is that? That's a minute 30. I don't know if it's worth re watching that. The investigation into the death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee continues. Uh, Nichols died several days after a violent traffic stop captured in body cam footage, which shows officers striking Nichols repeatedly. Five officers have been charged so far in connection with his death, and his death has prompted protests, protests and unrest across, across the country. Uh, here's a timeline of the events leading up to... Okay, I'm not really going to go through this. I don't know. <sighs> terrible. It's just terrible. Uh, let's go back. I don't want to... I'm not going to show the video. Like I don't want to show the video of, of this beating. I, I, I think... People who do that is that's a little fucked up, but let's let's read the fucking New York Post, I guess. Fucking why do they always show a picture of it? So this is written by Piers Morgan. Oh Jesus Christ! Let's not look at this. Like this, he's a fucking dumb bastard. So I don't have to say that it's clearly a case of racism, right? <laughs> uh, like the U.S trains their police specifically to be, you know, do these fishing expeditions where they pull over anybody and anybody they suspect. And it just so happens that it turns out like fucking most of those people that they pull over are black. And it just so happens that, uh, they have to be like that. They have, they get arrested or they get deal with, uh, friggin', uh, abuse in some way. Like it's, it's it's of course racism because of it's statistically proven that it is something that happens more often to black men and black women uh and probably black bi- non-binary individuals i don't want to gender this but black people uh more often than it happens to white people and even to people of other ethnicities um it's just very frustrating that of course, like Pierce fucking Morgan has a voice and like, why? Because he's a fucking blowhard, right? <sighs> Four of the five ch- officers charged in Tyree Nichols death had prior violations of work, which what speaks to a, <laughs> which speaks to a culture of allowing abuse by police officers on citizens. Four of the five Former Memphis police officers who have been charged in the death of Tyree Nichols had previous infractions with the department, according to Memphis police personnel records shared with NPR. Demetrius Haley, Desmond Mills, Emmett Martin, and Justin Smith and Tadarius Bean were fired January 20th and are now being charged with murder. Uh, Good. Good. Video of the January 7th incident was released Friday. Four of those officers, Haley... Martin, Mills, and Smith were reprimanded or suspended earlier for their failure to report when they had used physical force, failure to report a domestic dispute, or for damages sustained 
to their squad cruisers, according to the files for Memphis, from Memphis police. Bean did not have any reprimands or suspensions in the files. But that doesn't actually tell us anything about, you know, whether or not he, that officer is a good officer or not. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's pretty clear that this system is not working. The police don't work for the people. It's not news. It's not, it's not unusual to know this. So, uh, I want to, I want to go, I want to move on to something like, it. I don't know what else I can say about the Tyree Nichols thing, actually, like, because it seems so clear if one has any knowledge about the way the policing works, that this is also kind of just the way that policing works. And also that, of course, there's race involved. Even though the officers were black, they work in a system that's inherently racist and it targets black people and specifically. It's, it's really terrible that, uh, that this has to be explained over and over and over again and that people continue to deny it. It's just, it, it's backwards. It's nonsense. Um, so I'm going to share this tab instead. We've got from We Hunted the Mammoth. Misogynistic backlash getting worse in France. New report finds. This was from January 27th, 2023. David Futrell, I'm a big fan. Um, the misogynistic backlash isn't confined to the Anglosphere. Indeed, a new report from France's High Council for Equality Between men, Women and Men finds alarming levels of sexism in French society, especially among the young. Sexism is not re retreating in France, the report concluded. On the contrary, some of its most violent manifestation, manifestations are getting worse, and the young generations are the most affected. The study, which surveyed the opinions of 2,500 people, found that sexist attitudes are widespread in France among both young and older men. And that's, I think, a reference link right there. Here, I'll post this in the chat. Not that there's anybody paying attention, but that's fine. Just in case. Uh, the report highlighted masculinist cliches among the 25 to 34 age group. Around 20% said you had to brag about sexual exploits, quote, to be respected as a man, end quote, in society. Fuck that. Well, nearly, nearly a quarter of men said they sometimes had to be violent to gain respect. See, that's, I don't know, I don't know how it used to be in, uh, in uh, France. Like that's still a thing here, like in Canada. Like, so I guess the point of this isn't that it's different, but more so that it's the same. <laughs> so, uh, a quarter of all men thought there was too much attention being paid to the issue of sexual violence, and forty percent, Jesus Christ, and forty percent thought that women should give up their careers to care for children. Jesus, this is terrible, terrible attitudes. These attitudes influence behavior. For example, some 37% of French women say they have been pressured into sex they didn't want. Uh, yeah, okay, Jesus. 22% of 18 to 24-year-old women say they have been outright raped or assaulted. So that basically, that's 59% of women have been essentially like assaulted or raped, right? Because 37% of, of French women that say they've been pressured into sex they didn't want. Well, that's, I mean, that's coercion. That's like you've been pressured into sex as you've essentially been raped, right? Like, I don't, am I, am I wrong? I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's another form of rape, right? Among women aged 18 to 24, 22% said they had experienced psychological control or excessive jealousy from a partner with 15% saying they had been physically assaulted. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I, it's, uh, those numbers are pretty high. That's a lot of people. 22% said they experienced psychological control or excessive jealousy. I think that that's still kind of the norm within society though, is that the, the expectation is that men are, are the, are supposed to control their partners. It's, it's fucked up and wrong. It's, it's needs, needs to be changed. That's why we still need lots of feminism. Like we still need feminist outreach. We still need feminist, uh, uh, information being out, out there within the public and 15% saying they've been physically assaulted. I'm not sure what the stats are like here. Like, I'm sure they're not, they're not better. <clears throat> the council's president, Sil Sylvie Pierre Brossolette, 
told the Guardian UK that it's not enough to protect women and punish men. If we don't address the roots of everyday sexism and change the mentality, we'll never move forward. Everyday sexism leads to violent sexism. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. No, it's true. Interestingly, the report found that 82% of French people wish to see prevention and the fight against sexism become priority subjects on the agenda of the public authorities. It's just that they don't live up to these ideals in practice. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Uh, here's another, another from the Anarchist Federation. Ideas in Revolt. This was from January 23rd, 2023. Uh, the Institute for Anarchist Studies and Agency are partnering on a 2022-23 grants program and are excited to invite you to apply. For a quarter of the century, the IAS has funded creative work that furthers anarchist ideas and makes them accessible to br a broad audience. This year, the agency has joined forces. Agency has joined with the IAS to boost grant funding specifically for multimedia-focused projects such as podcast, video production, and live streams. Hey, that's me. I wonder if I should apply for this. We have a limited number of $500 to $2,000 grants available and would like to encourage, us, encourage anarchist creators with proposals for communicating anarchist ideas to apply. We are particularly interested in amplifying the voices of people who understand anarchist theory through lived experiences and embodied oppressions, as well as projects focused on practices and cultures of care as forms of resistance and examples of successes and wins, past and present. People from historically and currently underrepresented backgrounds are encouraged, especially encouraged to apply. Yeah. Hey, if you, uh, no, 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 no. Shit. Escape. Escape. There we go. I'm going to copy this link if I can do it. There we go. All right. This is all for those, for, uh, those interested. This is also going to be in the, uh, in the show notes on the YouTube channel once I've got this. Once I've got this all edited and, and, and posted, make sure to check it out. Apply. I'm not going to apply. Uh, I'm, I'm a very privileged person. I know that I have my, my issues and my bills, but I'm a very privileged person and I don't want to take money out of the hands of somebody who needs it or who could use it in a better way. I'm just going to, I'm just, you know, not going to apply. I'm just, a, you know, you know how it goes. Okay, so this is from Only Sky again. So this is uh, this is something that kind of touches on my past affiliation with the atheist community. Um, it came out on January twenty fifth. Uh, black non believers president tries to dodge allegations using ties to well known atheists amid abuse of power and misconduct allegations. Founder and president of Black Non Believers Inc. uses long held ties to dodge scrutiny. So this is written by Monica Burns, and this is about uh, somebody that I know, somebody that I've interviewed in the past, uh, Mandisa Thomas, uh, who was the founder and president of uh, Black Nonbelievers, and uh, there are allegations uh, of Unethical behavior, abuse of power towards uh, black non-believers members, and manipulation and coercion of others. Uh, and the board of black non-believers, they convened aboard the ship regarding what happened. So they uh, they talked and they, I, if I believe correctly, they voted her out of the as president. But uh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get too much into the details of this. I don't know exactly. Like this is one article written by one person, and uh, but there was credible enough accusations and and claims made by members of the Black Nonbelievers that uh, that uh, yeah other other groups like uh, the Black Skeptics of Los Angeles supported the Black Nonbelievers members and her decision to break away. Uh, she removed Mandisa from the annual Women of Color Beyond Belief event. And the American Humanist Association put her on leave of absence from their board pending an investigation. And however, uh, they're still we they're still waiting to hear from them. And she also got removed from the Godless Gospel Project, which is a non-religious musical ensemble. And of course, uh, Hemet Mehta, who has had some problematic things, like has said some problematic things in the past, has uh, has been 
criticized by uh, well-known atheists uh, like P.Z. Myers. Uh, has also, he came out uh, kind of defending Mandisa. Uh, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a believe the victims kind of person generally. So, and it, it kind of hurts uh, a little bit to know like that, you know, that I would, I, I could have uh, been unknowingly support. I was a patron of Mandisa's for a while, actually back in the day. Uh, I don't know wh whether she was behaving this way then, or if this is new behavior, but uh, if I was paying for somebody to be abused, that's something that I'm, going to have to reconcile in myself um but and there's also there's other allegations coming out about other people within the atheist community that i may or may not talk about because they are litigious as fuck uh so they will be uh yeah so we may we may not talk about it here but i'm always keeping my eye on the atheist community a little bit i've got some people that i really like there uh uh yeah, I guess that's about all I can say without uh, without going too far into air territory that I'm I'm not comfortable uh, going on. <clears throat> all right, so this is a local one for me. Uh, Sask parents and students pushing for the defunding of programs placing armed police in schools. And police say longstanding community resource pro programs help build up relationships. You don't need cops in schools. Get the kid cops out of the fucking schools. Like, do not do this. Chilombo Mwele is a recent graduate. This is this person of Dr. Martin Lamboldis High School and an organizer of recent Black Lives Matter rallies in Regina. She says the armed police liaison officer in her school did not make students feel safer. She and others want these programs abolished across Saskatchewan. And I support that entirely. I will do whatever I can to uh, help push that forward. Parents, students, academics, and others are pushing for an end to programs that place armed police officers in Saskatchewan schools. This is from the CBC. Critics say that school officers are intimidating, especially for Indigenous, Black, and newcomer students. They say the money, more than $1 million in each of Saskatchewan and Regina, would be better spent on meth mental health workers or school sports programs. Yeah, like mental health workers would be really helpful. It made me feel uneasy. Me and a number of my friends, we were uncomfortable, almost like walking on eggshells feeling, said Chilombo Muele, uh, a 2015 graduate of Regina's Dr. Martin Laboldis Catholic High School. Um, Wella, now a University of Regina student, was one of the organizers of a recent Black Lives Matter ra rallies. Recent? Oh boy. See, the, um, sometimes I feel like I'm really out of the loop, and even in my own province. Uh, <laughs> schools can already be an intimidating place. Let's make this change and help uplift everyone. These, these schools had cops in them back when I was going to school there. Uh, so... I can only imagine like how it feels for kids uh, now after like so much more, so much has come to light and is public about the way that police interact with the public. Like back when I was a kid, it was all, there was so much hidden. Like you had to be in certain circles to know that the police abused people and specifically that they abused people of color. Like, uh, like you may want to look up uh, if you are interested in Saskatchewan, look up Starlight Tours. Um, the Saskatoon Police used to uh, take Indigenous uh, youths out to the middle of nowhere in the middle of the winter and drop them off. And uh, multiple people have had uh, that like real bad issues. And uh, there was one very prominent uh, case where the young man uh, died because of it so yeah cops in saskatchewan they fucking suck just like everywhere else uh, uh but that's uh that's it for today that's all the stories i've got covered uh and i guess tomorrow i'm gonna read some anarchist theory i thought i would do anarcha feminism um so i'll talk about i'll, I'll read that and i probably won't have very many opinions about it but i will just read uh, I think it's a pamphlet or uh, maybe it's a chapter out of a book by uh, Chiara Botici. Uh, I hope I'm saying that name correctly. But uh, yeah, so tomorrow I'm going to do that. And uh, yeah, have a good one. Thanks everybody for watching. Got to push the right button.